come from is I started in the public service as a treasury economist. Uh, I did that as long as I could, which was about 10 years. Uh, and, uh, but my career has involved swapping between uh, research community, uh, ANU and CSRO in particular, uh, and, and public service roles with uh, a, a real conviction that <coughs> uh, both sides of the fence, the policy side and the research side, uh, need to have more empathy and attention uh, for, for the role of the other side. Um, because our institutions aren't working, the sort of over-specialisation that, um, uh, that politicians do politics and, and policy wonks do policy uh, doesn't seem to be delivering uh, in the time frame that the sorts of problems we, we address today require. So climate change is one of those. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is where I work, sustainability, climate change things. Um, but the, the introduction about um, and the, the comments about economic growth uh, and uh, inequality uh, and about uh, sustainability. Uh, one of our biggest problems, I'm convinced, is we think of those things as trade-offs. You know, how do you get um, better economic growth? Well, we'll just have to put up with more inequality. Uh, how do you get economic growth? We'll, we'll just have to put up with running down our natural assets. Um, <clears throat> and there was probably a time when that was true, uh, and that time is firmly no longer with us. So one of our biggest barriers is changing how we think and how we frame these problems. So I've got lots and lots of slides and I'm going to have to sort of talk a bit more quickly and jump around. And <coughs> uh, so so uh, one of the areas that I do most of my talking at the moment is about scenarios and futures and how the future is really uncertain. Uh, and so I like to sort of contextualise that usually by starting off with this. You know, what do we know? Economic growth is a thing. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of good things about economic growth. Uh, it's really powerful and it's going to reshape the world. All right. So if you're a slidey type person, if you like charts, the, the chart on the left uh, gives you global income distribution, roughly, out of our model, uh, in 2010. <clears throat> and so there's uh, countries on the, uh, on the left which are rich, uh, like Australia and the US and Canada uh, and the EU. Um, Japan is squeaking in there, and then there's a whole bunch of countries accounting for uh, another 6 billion people uh, who are not rich, who are well under the, the uh, World Bank's high income threshold. But when you fast forward under our current trajectory uh, to 2050, so 35 years, uh, you go from 1 billion people living under that line to, uh, sorry, over that line, um, to 3.5 billion people. Uh, over the high income threshold. So China's income in 2050 is roughly the same as Europe's average income now in less than a lifetime. Um, and if you go forward another 10 years from then to about uh, 2060 on our modelling, uh, under the standard definition you don't have developing countries anymore. So the world is a very different place. It doesn't mean that poverty no longer exists, but we're then talking about relative poverty rather than absolute poverty. Uh, which is probably the challenge already. Uh, now, what we don't know is how these interactions between uh, social and environmental pressures uh, <coughs> are going to play out uh, and what the implications will be and how nation-states are going to play that and whether nation-states will actually be the main actors anyway, uh, whether it's corporations or non-state actors or uh, fear. So <laughs> the world is a really uncertain place. And I'll come back later on. Sorry, it's just done a major project modestly called the National Outlook, uh, which explores some of those uncertainties with a particular lens. But <clears throat> the bottom line is, this for people not familiar with it, is the, the planetary boundaries diagram. It's sort of an icon uh, for the notion that we live uh, in a world that has limits, uh, that the physical limits are binding. The social limits exist, but are much harder to get a grip on. Okay, uh, And often the social limits can be flipped around to be empowering rather than constraints. <coughs> um, but it implies that we need to be um, stitched up in our thinking. We need to be integrated uh, and we need to be inclusive. So coming to, to climate change, I'm not going to give a big explanation about climate change and how it happens. I assume most people know that. Uh, the basic story is uh, <coughs> that there's this uh, uh, atmosphere around the planet. Uh, if you know, Al Gore explains it well when he holds up a, a globe uh, 
and says the atmosphere is about as thick as the varnish on the globe. It's a very thin layer. Um, <clears throat> so in, in the science community, people talk about the living zone, uh, which is from the, uh, the roots of the trees to the top of the canopy, uh, and then you have the buffer uh, of the atmosphere above and the water table below. Um, but in terms of the, <coughs> the planet, uh, it's like your skin. It's really important, um, but it's not very much of your body weight. <coughs> So what happens is we're changing the composition of that. Uh, we're still letting sunlight in, which is good, because otherwise it'd be dark and pretty cold. Um, but as CO2 and other gases increase, it stops the heat bouncing up. And so <coughs> over long periods of time, so we're talking two or 300 years, uh, that heats up the planet. Uh, and just like uh, it makes a big difference if your body core temperature is 36 degrees or 38, you know, a few degrees of difference makes a big difference to a complex system like the Earth. <coughs> So the main driver is emissions, so different types of gases. Uh, and that <coughs> science now understands uh, the physical Earth system pretty darn well. There are still some sensitivities about rates of change and speed of processes um, and sensitivity, but, but they understand the physical thing quite well. Uh, and what they're not brave enough to predict is how humans are going to respond to that. So I think that's a good judgment by the science community. So you end up with this wide range of possible futures, um, <clears throat> ranging from an increase of uh, at least seven. So seven is the midpoint of those, those high emissions futures. Uh, uh, seven degrees warming from in pre-industrial. Uh, <clears throat> last time the planet was about that warm, uh, you had alligators swimming uh, in the Antarctic. So that's pretty different sort of planet. Um, <clears throat> right down to best case, people are hoping that we might be able to keep things to 1.5 or 2 degrees. That's what the Paris Agreement is talking about. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think 2016 uh, is, is projected at the moment to be uh, 1.34 degrees higher than the industrial average. So presuming that's peaky, it's not necessarily the trend, um, but 1.5 degrees is going to be pretty hard to get to. I'll come back to that. <clears throat> the other thing to understand about climate, uh, climate science is that, uh, you know, there's a sociology of science and there are known biases and there are ways that scientists behave. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the things uh, that makes for a good scientist with a successful career is you don't publish things until you're pretty confident in it. Okay, so the published literature will always lag what people are pretty sure of um, because there's a burden of proof issue. Uh, and as a result of just that natural social process that you know you don't want to publish things which turn out to be wrong, um, <coughs> the, uh, the predicted impacts of climate change are monotonically increasing. So Every time they review the science, it's worse um, than they thought it would be before. And so this is an illustration of that. The first five columns, <coughs> it's the same study, repeated. So the first five columns is a, uh, it's called the glowing embers chart about things you should be concerned about, you know, like loss of major ecosystems or, or um, damage to human health and so on. <coughs> and then the same assessment redone in the second five columns uh, eight years uh, later. Uh, and all of the uh, all of the things that they call reasons for concern in their very uh, moderate language uh, had got worse over that time, um, <clears throat> and they'll probably repeat this in a few years' time, uh, and you can guess what will happen. And then <clears throat> a couple of years ago, there was a fabulous um, article published in two thousand and thirteen which ran about 700 scenarios. Um, I was a reviewer, not an author, on the article. Uh, ran about 700 scenarios, and they constructed it to look at all the big uncertainties. So, you know, uncertainty in the climate models, uncertainties in uh, how fast the world might decarbonise, uncertainties in uh, energy demand and the uptake of energy efficiency, uh, and implicitly, they were a bit more cautious about this, uncertainty in the politics. Okay, and basically they found that when you put all those things together, uncertainty in the politics dominated everything. Okay, more than half um, the variation in potential climate outcomes is how fast the world acts. Now these authors, like me, think it's almost axiomatic that the world will act. Okay, it's not a question of will the world act, it's when the world acts. Okay, and there are different ways you can explain that. You can look at sociology and how 
people's worldviews, how they engage with the world, which are formed when people come into young adulthood. So now all the people who have recently come to young adulthood know that climate change is a thing um, and we just have to wait for the old dudes to die out and the young dudes to come in. So that's one social process. The other thing, <coughs> I'm an economic determinist, uh, you just have to look at the length of the asset values of the people with political interests. Okay? They're coal-fired power stations. They last 35 years. Um, most of them are halfway through. So you're going to get, it's not going to be a smooth process. It's going to be a messy process. <clears throat> but the, this article, which was published in Nature, its finding was that if you waited five years, unfortunately for us that's five years from 2015 to 2020, um, the, the, the cost to the global economy of uh, achieving the same outcome more than doubled. Okay, so that's represented in the carbon price. The carbon price would go from $40 to about $90 to achieve the same outcome. So <clears throat> these long negotiations have real costs. And then just to state the obvious that we can't deal with climate change just on the emissions side. Okay, there's too much emissions already locked in. So this is <clears throat> a UK uh, heat map. And the reason I put it up is that most people I talk to in these sorts of forums uh, <coughs> hear these numbers about average warming and those sorts of things and they think, well, you know, two degrees or four degrees or whatever. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the way the, the global system works is that average warming uh, doesn't really occur anywhere. So <coughs> average warming technically is the average of land and sea surface um, we don't worry so much about sea surface because it has less impact on people. It does have some. Um, but the main thing is it's highly disproportionate. So warming at the poles is about three times faster than warming uh, at the equator. Um, and you're already, um, because of warming in the, in the Arctic, um, seeing methane release, um, which, is, which is problematic. So all the dismal stuff I've been talking to so far assumes that the only problem is emissions humans are putting into the atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> the amount of, so methane release happens because we've got a whole big bit of tundra. Um, uh, if you just look at the map, there's those big flat wide countries up near in the, in the north. Uh, they've got lots of tundra with lots of vegetable matter uh, which has been frozen for hundreds and hundreds of years and below the permafrost level. Uh, when you warm things, the level of permafrost drops, the stuff that thaws um, starts to rot. As it rots, it releases methane. Uh, the amount of methane that's stored in Arctic tundra uh, is about, it's hard to count, um, <clears throat> but it's at least two, probably three times more than all the emissions humans have put out in the last 200 years. So once we hit that tipping point, if the world gets warm enough, uh, and that's the real reason for the two degree target, okay? Because they're reasonably confident under two degrees, you won't get a lot of methane leakage, all right? Um, <clears throat> but since we've never done this experiment with the planet before, we don't know for sure. So I've got, I think, about four chunks of my slides. Um, I was a bit sick yesterday, so I didn't do quite as much preparation as I could have. So I'm going to talk for a minute about what are the sort of the broad policy tools and, and, and how do we do that and what's the economics of this? Is it an economic problem? Is it a political problem? <coughs> But I'll start effectively with the theory of policy change. So in the literature it's called adaptive governance because that sounds much more publishable than theory of policy change. Um, <clears throat> but essentially uh, there's this notion, the blue line in economics is known as the environmental Kuznets curve for reasons which I won't bother explaining. But essentially the notion is there's this harmony of interests. You know, as you go through a transition like the Industrial Revolution or, or whatever, that things will get worse for a while then they'll reach this natural sort of uh, turning point and things will get better. Uh, and so the <clears throat> people who believe in the harmony of interest say, you know, it looks bad, um, hold on, it will get better again. Uh, now in the environmental space, uh, <coughs> there's good evidence of that uh, in some problems, but there are other problems that are on this red trajectory that haven't hit the turning point yet uh, or we can't see why they would. And when you dig into the institutional characteristics, it's fairly straightforward that the problems that fix themselves uh, have local impacts, visible and understood, and when you discover there's something wrong, you can do something about it. So they're reversible. 
Uh, <coughs> so that's the institutional story. And on the red ones, you've got the opposite of that, that impacts are distant, and the most important notion of distance is social distance. Bad things happen to people I don't know, or people who aren't like me, or people I don't care about. Okay, so trade, attenuated relationships, those sorts of things. Uh, if it's attenuated in time, bad things happen in the future, um, makes plausible deniability even easier. Uh, they're complex and poorly understood, so you can have genuine arguments about whether it's a problem or what's causing it. Uh, and if you're really unlucky, like species loss, there's nothing you can do. Um. <clears throat> By the way, urban air quality is the only case study we've found on the blue curve. It's the only problem that is sort of self-solving in, in, that, in that way. I can talk about that later on. Um, but that tells you pretty, three pretty simple things. Okay? You have to know how the system works before you can manage it. Um, you have to have feasible responses. So in Sara we call those technologies and solutions. Um, and we, the people who have to support the decision, need to want to do something. All right? So climate change fully satisfies the first two things. Okay? We know more about this system than we could reasonably hope. Um, we've got all the technologies that we could deploy now uh, in, in cost-effective ways. Uh, our struggle is in the last thing. We haven't got a social consensus about whether we should do something uh, and how fast it should be. Uh, and the main reasons for that had nothing to do with climate science. They can be explained by other forms of science around social process and behavioural psychology. Um, <coughs> Okay, and one of those issues is that people are worried about the cost. All right? So I'm trying not to be too interesting. If you only remember one thing from what I've said, uh, cost is not the problem with climate change. Okay, so <coughs> economists uh, talk about opportunity costs all the time. I remember when I taught first year economics, you get everybody in the room, they hold hands, it's the only time economists are sort of social, and, and chant, true cost is opportunity cost, and then you have to do two or three weeks of lectures to explain what opportunity cost means. It's a really useful concept. Uh, and then we drop off the word opportunity and we talk about cost. And everybody thinks when we say the cost of you know, emissions reduction is going to be $40 or something, uh, that you have to take $40 out of your wallet and give it to somebody. And that's not what opportunity cost is. Opportunity cost means your income is going to rise $300 if we don't take action on climate change. And if you take action on climate change, it will only rise $260. So the difference is the opportunity cost. Um, but behavioural psychology tells you people behave completely differently towards you know, a cost, which is something that comes out of your current pocket, and a foregone gain. Okay, this is where the idea of a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush comes from. It's about uh, taking account of how these are going to go. I won't worry talking about these in detail, but the, the first two slides tell you that Australia could in, uh, reduce its emissions a great deal uh, and essentially makes almost no difference to income. So this is a reasonable proxy of income, uh, GNI per capita in Australia. Um, I've done reports where they required me essentially to do one of those blow-up inserts so you could tell the difference between the lines um, because the impact on income is so small. <clears throat> now, this result that you can make really deep cuts in emissions is not unique to Australia. It's not uh, a strange or aberration result. It's the dominant result. Okay? In all, I commissioned reviews, got lots of people to go do data mining on different reports because economists often don't report in this way uh, and there are some good reasons for that. <coughs> we could only find one study in the world where actual growth had, had declined uh, and it was a, as a study looking at the effect of delay. But you can't catch up the delay um, in a scenario where you had to reduce emissions to, to literally zero. Um, <coughs> and so, um, uh, <coughs> so the result holds uh, globally, it holds for all regions of the world. Uh, it holds across a very wide range of ambition. <clears throat> okay, and then <clears throat> when you look at the economics, the wider you draw your boundary about the things you're, you care about, the stronger the argument for taking action on climate change becomes. Okay, if you just look at impacts within the economy, you, you get small ratios. Um, but when you take account of uh, equity, so climate change 
inevitably uh, affects people with the lowest incomes, the most vulnerable. Uh, uh, when you start looking at impacts on ecosystems uh, and the services ecosystems to provide to, to Australia. And when in a different sense, when you start looking at most likely impacts and start looking at the range of possible impacts, uh, <coughs> it changes, in a sense, your, what would be sensible to invest in avoiding climate change by more than an order of magnitude. Okay, because <coughs> uh, when you're thinking at what's the most likely impact, um, that's not how we choose to insure our houses. Okay, so for probabilities are much smaller than the house of a chance of a house fire, um, <coughs> you get quite significant rational responses about guarding against uncertainty. Um, I won't worry about this slide. There's a debate in the economics community uh, from 2006 uh, where it was everybody against Nicholas Stern um, uh, and he got lots of criticism and, and all but one of the prominent economists who were involved in that debate have now agreed with Stern uh, but all of them have done it very quietly uh, without very much fanfare. Uh, <coughs> So, such as the ego of major economists, I'm sure your community is not like that. Um, and then I was involved as an advisor on the assessment that the Australian government did before it announced its uh, target that it took to Paris. Um, and essentially, it's the, the same story. Yeah. Here's the range of potential emissions trajectories that was studied, and uh, here's the range of income outcomes. Okay, so that. The biggest outcomes are in the order of 1%. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, um, I think this is GDP rather than GNI, um, but more typically it's about 0.3 of a percent. And <coughs> the difference between the two targets we argue about is, is in that range. It's sort of 0.1 of 1%. Um, <coughs> so the, the story holds for current policy. All right, I'm going to talk briefly. I think I've got about 10 minutes more. Yeah, all right. <coughs> I'm going to drop in to a little bit of sort of unpaid advertising for CSIRO. So, so I, um, in my role, uh, had the privilege to, to lead the, the most exciting project ever, um, <coughs> which was uh, looking at the, uh, how the future for Australia might play out under a range of different circumstances. Now, because it was the first time and we genuinely didn't know whether it worked uh, and would work, and CSIRO chose to focus on things that it knows pretty well. So we modelled the whole Australian economy in the context of the whole global economy, but the detail we were trying to get right was around our resource-intensive industries, so agriculture, energy systems, uh, coal exports, <coughs> uh, water supply, those sorts of things. So the physical things that CSIRO's got a lot of expertise in. And one of the things we found is that... Uh, so we, one of the uncertainties, we were exploring seven different uncertainties, um, some social in nature, some technological. Um, <coughs> and uh, all the scenarios where the world started to take stronger action, so the report was published in 2015, two weeks before Paris, um, we found that Australia could reduce its per capita emissions below global average. Now, a fair bit of that uh, hands through, uh, happens through land sector carbon, which is sensible for Australia to plant. So, <coughs> These lines are sort of a, uh, this is where we were on track before Paris. This is what, analogous to what we would say we were on track for after Paris. And so this is the global average. So if we get down below the global average on, on all those scenarios, and we do it through, you know, <coughs> our goal we'd call silver buckshot. You do lots of little things, and they add up. <coughs> Land credits are these big blue bars, so they're third to 40% of the total abatement achieved. So this is what happens if you do nothing. This is where you end up with different forms of abatement. So the land sector is really important, but it's not the only game. <coughs> and then we were pretty pleased. We, we published the sort of headline findings in, in Nature. Uh, we even got on the cover, which I was quite proud of. Um, <coughs> and this is the reason we got on the cover is because we managed to sort of pick the political story as well as the technical story. So you don't get in nature unless you do cool techie things and they really rake you over the coals for that. Um, but how we explain this, this is our, uh, one of the three key findings of the big report. Uh, 
<coughs> that sustainability and economic growth can be partners and not competitors. And for us, that's a, a physical decoupling story. So in all the 20 scenarios we've done, income goes up. And then there's these subsets of scenarios <coughs> where you meet uh, three or four environmental conditions that emissions uh, uh, fall dramatically, uh, that we get no increase in water stress in Australia, which is quite challenging for Australia, uh, and that we reverse land clearing. We start to restore native habitat. It's not that we stop land clearing, it's that we reverse it. Uh, and we do all those things while getting the good stuff we like. So energy use increases in all the scenarios where emissions are going down. <coughs> Total water use increases in all the scenarios where water stress is stable or declining. Uh, and all but one variant scenario of protein output from Australia increases while we're restoring habitat. <coughs> and these are non-trivial changes. So emissions are going below zero. That's pretty important. Um, <coughs> water use is stable. That's about the best we can do. Uh, in Australia, uh, <clears throat> but we get a 10% reduction in biodiversity threat um, from these. <coughs> so it's interesting. This is where the science is and it's not where the politics is. The politics is still stuck in the 1970s. And my observation from further away is exactly the same as happening in social process. So you've now got the IMF, you've got the World Bank, you've got other, you know, not the usual suspects coming out and saying, and not investing enough in addressing inequality. And what we mean by not addressing enough in inequality is we're suppressing economic growth. We're throwing away income and productivity growth because we're being too miserly. All right? And it's a reversal of the old framing that if you want people to work, you have to hit them harder. Okay? Um, <coughs> so uh, too much stick and not enough carrot is, is not a good way to get productivity uh, out of our donkeys. Um, <coughs> so it's, uh, the last key message, or the third key message from the SARA report is that Australia has agency in this space. Decisions we make matter, uh, and decisions we take in the near term matter, because a lot of those decisions have long term footprints. Okay, so when you build a new power generation facility, whether it's a wind farm or a coal, uh, it's going to last, you know, <laughs> the working life of somebody just starting work. It'll be out there for 35 or 40 years. <coughs> Some things you get faster turn. So electric vehicles, we're all going to be surprised um, <coughs> uh, because we're going to move to electric vehicles because it's cheaper uh, and we're going to move to self-driving cars because we don't really like driving. Um, <coughs> is this a slide I thought? Yes. Uh, and so one of the things that we found when you do this sort of work where you start looking across silos, across things that are normally analysed by themselves, um, you get surprising results because of context. So <coughs> Australia has had some debate, we could say, about decarbonising our electricity sector. All right? And we find essentially that decarbonising the electricity sector has a pretty modest impact on household affordability of electricity. Okay? And that's in part because people respond by substituting capital, so they buy better fridges when electricity is cheaper. They end up with more cold beer at lower price. All right? What we've been ignoring is well, what some people are referred to as gold plating in our energy distribution system, which is about managing peak demand. Okay, and it's a complicated, unsexy problem that sits out of public view. We find that that issue is six times more important to affordability than decarbonising the electricity sector. Okay, and, but nobody's been talking about it. So there are, you can get surprises. <coughs> A second surprise is that in our modelling, we assume Australian population growth keeps growing at about the rate it has been, so it goes by roughly two-thirds over 40 years. <coughs> the previous 40 years, it grew closer by three-quarters than two-thirds, so it's a little bit slower. When you've got that many extra people, they drink water. It's funny that. Uh, most of our people live in places where we're out of water, you know, unless we want to wreck our river systems. Uh, we find you can improve water security by implementing a lot of desalination. Uh, people get puzzled by that until you go through the maths. If in the current debate you're choosing between reducing water from an existing dam versus building a plant, and unsurprisingly, using water from an existing dam is always going to be cheaper than building anything. All right? But when you're faced with you know, an extra 14 million people, okay, 
you can't supply enough water out of existing dams. You have to do something new. And when you're thinking about building a whole new dam system versus building a desal plant, they're cost competitive. It depends on the exact circumstances, which is going to be cheaper. Um, but the ace in the hole is we don't have places to build dams anymore near where people live in Australia. So desal essentially is your, your, your only option. You can improve water use efficiency by a lot of industrial reuse. So you take water that's been used once, and if it's being used to, to, to clean things after they've been welded or in fabrication, there's a whole bunch of uses where um, <coughs> the water you're using actually probably meets all the health standards you require, but people are worried about drinking poo. Um, so you use it for separate things. But <coughs> might end up using 4 to 6 per cent of total electricity supply to power all this desal, but that's not an issue. And then there's other stories. <coughs> one, one of the techie innovation things that, that got us into nature is we use this new, very groovy uh, land use map that produces these really detailed maps. It's a one kilometre grid, so you can zoom in and look at land use around Gunnedah or, or, or whatever it is that, that you're interested in. Uh, and essentially one of the things we find is that, well, first, uh, there's more synergies than trade-offs. Um, uh, when you start thinking across silos, when you start connecting up different, different areas. Uh, <clears throat> but the other thing we find is that sort of a, uh, the middle ground, the world taking middle ground position on climate change is the worst thing for Australia. Okay, we find that if the world says, oh, this climate change thing is a load of rubbish, well, let's go back to burning coal, we make a lot of money. That's great. Don't want to live for a long time, but we make a lot of money in the short term. Uh, or if the world says we're going to do more, that's great for Australia. And it's great for Australia for two reasons. So a middle ground future is a gas-dominated future, and Australia's not very good at gas, mostly because nobody connects to us. Okay? And when you have to liquefy gas and put it on a ship, it's a very expensive way of exporting it only Japan, basically, and a few places want uh, LNG. Um, but if you go to renewables, boy, we could do really well at renewables. So that's one part of the story. The other part of the story is we're the only country in the world with a lot of cleared land that you could plant for tr trees and soak up carbon. All right, And we find out that planting trees and soaking up carbon could be worth a lot more than the coal industry is worth. So <clears throat> it's funny what happens when you do the numbers. But the point here is that you have to be looking across. You have to think in integrated ways. <coughs> so, was Paris enough is a question I don't really have a slide for, so I'm just putting up was Paris enough for the groovy sort of info thing. Uh, and now we're well out of the realms of sort of science. This is expert judgment, so this is my opinion and can only be quoted as my opinion. Uh, so I think Paris was the best possible outcome. All right. The reason for that, <coughs> so there's this stylized debate about we want everything to be you know, legally binding and tied down and really great. All right. Now, countries like people are risk averse. All right. So most countries who, when they make promises, intend to keep them, so that's an important caveat, will only promise things that they're confident they can achieve. All right. So the, the country commitment process in something like Paris will always be underbidding. All right, and the, the more stringent you make the rules for achieving what you promise, the less people will promise to do. All right, so Paris dealt with that by specifying a more ambitious goal than we thought, so well below two degrees, um, which is technologically possible, but extraordinarily challenging, um, while getting, while locking in commitments which are effectively about five years out of date by the time they get through the UN system. So all the commitments are underwhelming. Okay? Even the best countries have underwhelming commitments. Um, but then promising this review process. Now, I'm quite optimistic about Paris because I read Paris as handing over from government to business. All right? So here's my prediction. You can check on me in five years' time. I think what we'll see is the people who write loans and insurance, so the global financial sector, now we'll treat Paris as a sufficient guide to sovereign risk, okay? And so they will lend money to renewables and to gas and to uh, low emissions cement and all the rest of it. They will lend it at a cheaper rate than they will lend it to a new coal mine, all right? And so essentially we've shifted from a position where you had 
a negotiation which was set up to protect the interests of fossil fuels, and you had a particular sector who have no, no good news for them, okay, to a much, much larger and influential sector who just want to make money, all right, and they don't care whether they're making money off coal or off renewables. Um, but the reason I'm optimistic about Paris is because uh, I'm happy that those guys will now attach lower sovereign risk to renewables and they'll make more money out of renewables. And there's a, a bunch of wider synergies around the SDG goals and those sorts of things. <clears throat> but what in practice, how do we implement policy? I'm going to race through this because this is the least interesting bit of my talk. So the way I think about <coughs> society, and it's a bit techy, so sorry for that, is like you've got layers. You've got individual people running around doing stuff. And then above individual people, you've got groups and networks and organisations uh, who, who have rules. So, you know, there's ways I have to equip my credit card with, when I spend money at CSIRO. And then above that, you have goals, expectations and norms. All right? And of these, the top layer evolves the most slowly. Okay? And I've been implicitly arguing climate change that a lot of our problems is they're thinking about the problem in the wrong way. We've got presumptions which are just dead wrong. Um, <coughs> And you can engage with this in different ways. You can tell people that use of current assets. You know, do you turn off your light um, when you leave the room? You can engage with people when they're making decisions about asset choices. You know, do you buy a car or do you buy a bike? All right. These asset choices are shaped by your thoughts about infrastructure. Okay. So one of the reasons people don't buy electric cars is because of range anxiety, because we don't have fast uh, charging stations when you go down the coast. So you can't use your electric car down there. Now that's partly a technology problem, that we should be just having swap and go battery packs. All right? And for trucks, those battery packs would be on forklifts. So when you drive into the Maroolan thing and they go off to get their uh, light salad with, with a rocket on the top, um, the forklift would just plug in and you'd be... Right. These infrastructure choices uh, are governed by rules. So I was talking before, we have regulated rates of return in electricity transmission uh, infrastructure, and it's hopelessly biased towards overbuilding infrastructure. So we build infrastructure which is used for up to four hours a year. And surprisingly, it's hard to get a rate of return. And then you've got this stuff about understanding consequences. Now, part of this is I've grayed out a bit about values change, because I think People often talk about sustainability in, as implying a need for values change. I go to a church, I'm a person of faith, I'm very um, <coughs> attuned to the importance of values and I'm firmly in the view that we do not need values change. Okay, sustainability is a really big thing. If you're part of the planet, it's a broad church. If you can't explain to people from a wide range of perspectives, why sustainability is important, you're not really talking about sustainability. Okay, to implement sustainability, that's it's a six term or ten terms of government agenda. If you haven't got middle ground there, uh, you, you're, not, you're not talking about the right thing. Okay, so if, if what you're doing isn't important enough to plug in sort of values and you know, foundational um, goals and aspirations of a wide range of the community, um, Else, yes. Understanding consequences is crucial, though. Okay? And you do get an unhealthy play between those things. <coughs> I'll run the class more quickly. I won't really talk about this. There's different things you can do to reduce emissions. You do them in different ways. Let's not worry about that. Um, <coughs> often, a, a new problem just gives us a better case for an old solution. So, I think it was in 2008, it might have been 2007, there was this massive heat wave <coughs> in, in Europe. Lots of uh, old people um, died from heat stress. Um, <coughs> the, what did the, the uh, people in Paris do about that? They started a Get to Know Your Neighbour program. Okay? Get to Know Your Neighbour is probably the oldest technology we have. You know, it, It's reconnecting with notions of tribe and identity and it's giving people permission to go and be nosy, preferably before the heat wave, you know, hey, how are you? Would it be okay if next time there's a heat wave forecast I just come and check on you? Make sure you've got a fan or I could drop you down to the library where there's air conditioning. So 
This is a more recent shot of Paris being uh, adaptive in the heat. But there's a lot of this is just about good process, connecting things up, thinking about what the real problem is. Okay, the problem is not just that it's hot, it's that it's hot and people are isolated. They don't have social support. And then, two minutes. Let's just talk about a couple of things about these notions about what gets in the way of adaptive governance. Remember, that's my catchy jargon for, you know, how does policy get better. <coughs> so the first issue is that research never cuts it, okay? Research and science and facts um, uh, do absolutely nothing by themselves, okay? Research and science and facts only make a difference when somebody cares about those results and somebody carries those facts into public debate, okay? So you always need a relationship <coughs> between advocacy groups, all right? Now, some advocacy groups wear white hats, and we like them, and some advocacy groups wear black hats, and we don't like them, and your black hats are probably not the same as my black hats, but I think you'll get the idea. So <coughs> I used to say, this is really good, because look, research is blue and advocacy is red. Research is most important in environment and agriculture, and then I look more closely at the side. Turns out that health wins the stakes. So this is US data. It's a fabulous, fabulous study, oh, which I have got on the slide. A guy called uh, Matt Grossman. He's written a book called The Art of the Possible. And essentially, he's mined about 40 years of um, uh, federal US legislation passing and done associations. So you can't do causation, so he's done associations. Uh, who were the players? And contrast health, where research is more important than advocacy, uh, with civil rights and liberties, you know, race relationships, um, sexuality, uh, gender equality. <coughs> uh, research and science basically have no traction whatsoever. Um, so, <coughs> so research is important, but it's not important. In isolation, it has to be communicated well. You need people who care. Um, the thing I come back to most often is the notion of worldviews. So <coughs> there are different ways of splitting into this up. This is a, a quadrant diagram where you have people who um, care more about their equal outcomes uh, versus self-reliance. So <coughs> this would be more equal rights, but it's often equal rights for people who are already powerful. Um, and then across this way, you've got pro-status quo, you know, classically conservative um, versus uh, progressive or, or people who want to change the status quo. Uh, <coughs> so it's easy enough to design survey instruments where you can classify people into these different quadrants. The interesting thing is um, the, the confusion between facts and values. Okay, so when you run a survey where you classify people like this, and then you, which tells you what sort of society they would like. And then you ask some fact questions. So what in America explains individual success? Okay, that's a fact question. And depending where on the quadrant they are, they will tell you, you know, <coughs> uh, family of origin, i.g. you come from a rich family, you'll be successful. Or hard work and thrift, or entrepreneurialism. Or, and so people have, once you, people move out of their area of immediate expertise, and it doesn't matter whether that's fixing cars or designing policy, they revert to intuition, and intuition muddles facts and values. So that's worldview bias. It's very closely related to confirmatory bias, but you can give, actually I'll just give two examples. Confirmatory bias, in a controlled experiment, you give people <coughs> uh, the same article, you've separated them out by here, and you ask them whether the article makes them believe their views more strongly or not. Okay? And what you find is the people who are furthest towards the edge in any direction are more convinced that the article supports their views. Okay? Even though in their space the article is telling them different things. It should be pulling them to the middle. So that's classic confirmatory bias. The other is uh, comfort with prescriptions. And so <coughs> similar sort of experiment run by the same guy, in fact, in, in Yale. You give people the same article, one, this is about climate change, one has uh, climate change means pollution controls, okay? And the other has climate change means nuclear power, all right? And people who are up here really like nuclear power, okay? It's big, it's run by engineers, it's centralised, it's shiny, all right? 
And people down here really like pollution limits because they don't trust business and they want government to be doing more and pollution is bad. Okay? So the consequence of climate change influences people's acceptance of the idea of climate change. Okay? And I normally illustrate this with a health example. Okay? So if your doctor comes and tells you, you know, really sorry, you've got cancer, poorly trained doctor walks out, lots of people go into no denial. All right? It's a healthy response, in fact, if you can't do anything about it. But if you've got a better trained doctor and they come in and say, I'm sorry, you've got cancer, here are the three sorts of treatment options we think you should be considering, and here are the, the consequences and, and what it means for you in real day terms. People, more people, not everybody, more people grapple with the treatment options. They accept the diagnosis and they grapple with what to do about it. And part of the problem with how the science community has framed the whole climate change thing uh, is we've talked not enough about the treatment options. So you've got this systematic um, bias around consequence, so likelihood of consequence, which is your risk framework. Um, you've got this secondary channel, well, I think it's secondary, uh, about um, peer support. So if you're a barber in Alabama who thinks climate change is something to worry about, you, you don't tell your customers that. You just cut their head. If you're looking for a job, you know, there are network implications about you know, being a, a sound fellow or whatever it is. So there are social processes that support that. There are things we can do. Most of it's pretty common sense. You know, think about a diversity of voices. Think about shared value. Think about partnership approaches. I reckon I'm probably out of time, so I should just stop there. <laughs> um, right, so that's it. You can ask me questions in the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.